man himself. Please come and join us. to be in this conference to share this time with you. You know, um, I wear this clothes right now because uh, this is what I'm going to look like being retired. Uh, but don't be deceived by what an old dog looks like. Um, I intend to be engaged. I intend to be involved so I can share with you the joy, the excitement, of achieving the dream of having a no-kill nation, a nation that guarantees all the dogs and cats of America a loving home. And we are close to being there. Now, just before we get into why I think it's going to happen, I'd like to share with you some of the history. Back in the day, uh, this goes back uh, into the 70s, uh, our nation was a different world for animal welfare. Actually, it was a very ugly world. Uh, when I joined uh, the cause, and when Best Friends was just getting started. In those times, the basic conversation from the animal welfare community and from the leaders of animal welfare and for, at the national conferences was, what is the best way we're going to kill our best friends? And the accepted methodology generally used was the decompression chamber. It might astonish you to believe that spay-neuter clinics did almost, were almost non-existent. It was best thought that the way we control birth control is to kill all the females. We kill all the female dogs, we kill all the female cats, and that way we won't have litters born. What a silly time. The uh, idea of contamination, unfortunately, was very, very common. Contagion was rampant in shelters. And the accepted methodology was to exterminate all those that were exposed and all those that were ex uh, potentially exposed. Pets were kept very, very short times in kennels. The kennels and cages were very, very small. And that's because people didn't expect them to be there very long. Volunteers were very rare, and foster care was almost non-existent. People were mistrusted. The blame was put on the American people. Too many animals, not enough homes, the reason people were negligent, people were deficient, people weren't getting the job done, so we couldn't trust them. Shelters operated, at least in San Francisco, four days a week from 11 in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon because people who worked shouldn't have pets. The focus was on the cutes and cuddlies, the low-hanging fruit, the animals that were under five years of age. The old and uglies, we had to pass over them. Now that I've moved into that generation myself, <laughs> uh, I consider it particularly alarming and disturbing. <laughs> Death was considered a kindness. No, I'm still here, you guys. It's not going to happen. Animal welfare organizations were very, very comfortable in bashing and trashing. It was the norm. So at a point in time, we decided best friends, uh, myself, and a lot of the organizations uh, thought that these conditions had to change. And so we started on a path to reverse all this stuff, change the, the dialogue, focus on what's really important, talk about animal lovers and what we can really accomplish together. I was particularly inspired in a very dramatic moment when a little dog named Saito came into my life. Now, for you who can look at the slide, the dog is on the left, and, and I'm the guy on the right. I had hair then, 
and I was in my 30s. Saito, uh, owner, had committed suicide and left a will saying that her dog should be killed. Mary Murphy, uh, the owner of Saito, uh, was taken away by the medical examiner, and Saito was entrusted to us until uh, we could uh, find out what was going to be uh, her eventual placement. When we were told by the executrix that Saito was supposed to die, we said, nah, no, 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 we, we are going to save Saito just like we want to save them all, and every animal is going to be a ch given a chance. And she said, no, you're not, because I have the will, I have the law, you better comply or you're going to regret it. And we said, no, <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. And she said, you know what we're going to do? I said, well, go ahead and sue me. Actually, I didn't say sue me. I said, sue the San Francisco SPCA. <laughs> but she sued me and the San Francisco SPCA. <laughs> and she said, you know, we're, we're going to take your home, we're going to leave you penniless, we're going to accuse you of stealing, and so we're going to put you in jail. I said, that sounds sort of harsh. <laughs> Why don't we go to the court and ask them to reconfigure the will so that Saito can find a loving home? She said, I'm going to file the papers tomorrow. So I said to Saito after... Uh, Rebecca Wells Smith left, you're going to have to come home with me because this legal battle is probably going to take months. You don't belong here. You, you need to be in a, somebody's home. You're going to be one of my fosters. So that night, I came home and I said, honey, I'm home. <laughs> and by the way, I have another foster dog here. The good news was my family immediately fell in love was love at first sight, and she joined the family. Now that night when I went to bed, Saito jumped in bed with me. She snuggled up next to me, because that was the way we were going to live together. And when my wife got in bed, she growled. <laughs> you, you can understand that this is a turning point, can't you? Okay. So while we were filing the papers, I called up a reporter and I said, you got to come down here and meet this little dog who's supposed to die that we're not going to let go on to the next world. And the reporter from the biggest newspaper in town showed up in my office, he sat in the chair, and he said, interesting story, but why this dog? In the country, you are killing tens of millions of dogs and cats every year. In this city, you are killing tens of thousands of dogs and cats every year. Why this dog? On cue, Saito gets up from her nap, goes over, licks the hand of the reporter, puts her paw on the knee, snuggles up close, and the reporter says, I get it. <laughs> he told the story, and the story was told and retold and told every week, many times, several times a week, for six months. Just towards the end of the legal battle, um, some politicians heard that Saito was getting a lot of attention, and so they decided, let's get involved. <laughs> so they introduced legislation to save her life. Now, in a former life, I had been a lobbyist in Sacramento, and it took me years to get legislation through. Well, Saito's legislation went through in three weeks, both houses <laughs> of our assembly and our Senate. Now, you have to understand, she was the charmer. She went to the hearings. She sat next to me. I tried to testify. She they put her paws over her eyes like, oh, my God, what is he saying? Uh, but we passed the law over the objections, by the way, of the humane community. All the animal activist lobbyists in Sacramento opposed her legislation. But we, well, even though we got it through both houses in three weeks, the governor wouldn't sign the bill. So we go to trial, and, at the, and in the court, all the cameras are there. CNN, ABC, CBS, um, the networks, the, the wire services, the radio reporters, uh, the uh, newspapers, and the judge comes in and says, I'm ready to rule on the Saito case. And all of a sudden, the phone rings, and the clerk says, uh, 
Judge, uh, the governor is on the phone. Picks up the phone. The governor says, I'm going to sign the bill. And he says, you're too late, governor. Bang. And so he proceeded to rule that Saito had a right to life. It was the first animal rights case decided in America. And it basically said that dogs and cats are not property. They are living, sentient beings. The court also allowed uh, Saito to be placed with me. And we had a wonderful life together for five glorious years. She was an old dog. She was 11 years old. On her 16th birthday, she had a stroke, and shortly after that, passed on. But she actually uh, demonstrated what companion animals are all about. Her story on the nightly news and in the newspapers ended up in the, the American Bar Association Journal, was on Encyclopedia Britannica, and was relied on by many, many cases throughout the United States and even throughout the world today. So she was very, very special to me. Now, I would like to talk about where we've come since uh, cases like that were initiated. You can see here that uh, we are doing pretty well comparative to where the country was uh, back in the day. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom of the slide where I talk about 2015. I believe this year we can reduce the euthanasia of companion animals to 700. We can guarantee that the healthy and treatable dogs and cats of America are going to have a loving home. We're going to have a 90% or better save rate, and that's two deaths per thousand. Now, some of you might have trouble believing that we can do that this year. Okay, but I want to ask you what, do you, what do you want? What do you want in this room? Now, some of you might want to say we want to reduce the number of animals killed. Some of you might say that we really want to save the easy to place. I believe the vast majority of you in this room want to save them all. So, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions throughout this presentation, which won't go on for too long. Uh, and I'd like your response. And the first question is going to be, what do you want? And the next question is going to be, now. Excuse me. The next question, that's not a question. That's an answer, isn't it? <laughs> See what happens to old dogs? You've got to have some compassion here. Okay. So the first question is, what do you want? And the next question is going to be, when do you want it? Now, I'm hoping when I say, what do you want, you're going to say, no kill. And then when I ask you when you want it, you're going to say, now, why do I think you want to say now? We don't want to wait 10 years. We don't want to wait three years. We don't want to wait while the dogs and cats in our shelters and in our rescue and foster homes are waiting for a loving home. They can't wait that long. Their life is on the line now. So I'm going to ask you right now, what do you want? And when do you want it? Now! That's pretty good. I'm going to ask that, just because I'm a little hard of hearing being this old dog, I'm going to ask you one more time. What do you want? Now! When do you want it? Now! All right. Now, we believe that no kill is possible now. Why do I feel so cocky and confident about that? Well, first, I'm a little weird. But <laughs> getting past that, we have some fantastic examples of wonderful success. Those wonderful tributes that those people made on this slide are the leaders of our nation. Those are the people who are making life-saving work a daily experience. These are the people that are going to save them all, and all of you are the ones that are going to save them all. The expertise that you listen to in the various workshops here at Best Friends, No More Homeless Pets Conference, give you the tools. They give you the inspiration. They give you the ability to see what can and will be done across this land. And no longer is veterinary care uh, uh, marginal. 
we now have board certified specialty with shelter medicine. First time in our nation that a, a board certified specialty recognized by the American Veterinary Medical Association as a veterinary science has acknowledged the importance of shelter animals and has given us the tools and the expertise with these shelter medicine programs to help us save them all. We, are, we also have money. Now, most of you don't need money. Uh, most of you are independently wealthy and have too many resources and don't know how to spend it. But for those of you who have it, it might be encouraging to know that back in the early 70s, less than $1 million was given to companion animal welfare to save uh, pet lives. Today, that number is $100 million coming from charities. PetSmart Charities, uh, Best Friends, um, uh, Maddie's Fund is in there. Yeah, Maddie's Fund is in there. Okay. Uh, pet, like I said, PetSmart Charities, Petco, a, a lot of fantastic organizations uh, putting a lot of money into uh, basically help save companion animals. The recent data shows that we are the second fastest growing philanthropy in the United States today. I predict that we are going to have twice as much money in the next three years. We're having $100 million given to you through grants, and I expect that number to double within the next three years. So you're going to have a lot more resources. And we are going to have awareness. As Gregory sp uh, spoke to yesterday, <laughs> uh, we are becoming mainstream. It might surprise you to know that in the last five years, over a billion dollars, that's a B, over a billion dollars has been donated to promote dog and cat adoptions in free space and paid space by the charities and by the animal welfare organizations and by the local media. That, that's pretty powerful when you think about all this getting out there to basically say, Rescue and shelter adoptions are the best place to find a companion animal. Now, I'm, I'm impressed by this slide. I don't know what, what you guys think of it. But I'm impressed by this slide because it shows you that we went from, over the last eight years, from a 21% market share to more than a 39% market share. What I mean by that is, of all the dogs and cats in people's homes, about 180 million dogs and cats in people's homes, 39% came from shelters and rescue. Whereas only eight years ago, we only had a 21% market share. Now, this is during one of the worst times, one of the worst recessions this country has ever experienced. When homes were being foreclosed on, when people were put out of work, when charitable dollars coming into local organizations was reduced and municipal funding was slashed. During that period, despite of all that negativity, we went from 21% to 39%. Now today, when we, when we think about how wonderful that is, we have to realize that we are there because the American public is with us. They are spending about $60 billion a year on taking care of companion animals. Today, 72% of American households have a pet. That's compared to about 50% 10 years ago. 70, as Gregory mentioned yesterday, 72% of the Americans, when polled, believe our country should be no-kill. 84% when asked about the relationship they have with their companion animal, consider them family members. We do not kill family members. As a matter of fact, when people were asked if you were stranded on an island, and you had the choice of having a pet or having another person, 57% said they want a pet. So I ask you, what do we want?
When do we want it? Now. One more time. What do we want? Now. And when do we want it? Now. All right. We got that established. So, oh, so the math is easy. From the studies that we have done, we have found out that 29 million people this year are going to add a companion animal to their home, and they haven't decided where they're going to get it. Hey, guys, that's us. We need 2.3 million of those 29 million to adopt from shelters and rescue. That is not, that should not be considered a difficult task. 2.3 million out of 29 million possibles. That's less than 10% performance. I mean, I got better grades than that when I was in college. <laughs> so, so we want to step up. Now, we've got the ingredients. You know, we've got, we've got the medical community with us. We've got the expertise and the knowledge and we're getting resources, and we're increasing our awareness. So what is, mess what is missing? What's going to get us over that next little hurdle? I think we have to make it personal. And what do I mean by making it personal? We have found out through our research that people are seven times more likely to adopt from a rescue or shelter if they hear somebody's story about where they got their companion animal seven times more likely to adopt from a shelter or rescue if they have heard that the animal came from a shelter or rescue. So we have to tell our story. And all we have to do is talk about our pets. That's not all that hard. I can do that for hours and days. And that's just my pets. So. Right now, there are 220 million people that care for a companion animal in America. 220 million people have companion animals in their lives. 84% of them consider them family members. Less than 10% of those 220 million belong to animal welfare groups at the local level. But if we basically uh, leveraged our memberships and our supporters to encourage people to tell their story, if we told our story and then encouraged them to get other people to tell their story, we could ha potentially have 220 million people out there saying that the shelter and the rescues are the best place, the first place, in my view, the only place to uh, basically adopt your next pet. Now, that, that shouldn't be too hard, right? Less than 10 percent. 29 million people are going to get a pet. 2.3 million need to get from us. 220 million voices out there. 72% of the people have pets in their households right now. Hey, this is going to be easy. This is going to be a slam dunk. So I'm going to ask you again. What do we want? And when do we want it? Now I want to tell you what that means. When we can guarantee the dogs and cats of America a loving home, when we reject killing as a legitimate method for managing populations, we will establish a humane ethic that the country has never seen before. And when we say killing is not appropriate as a management tool, maybe we can stop using killing as a sport for, pet, uh, for animals, we can stop the killing of urban wildlife. We can stop the killing of so-called predators in wilderness areas. We can stop the killing of wildlife altogether because it's not a legitimate management tool. And I believe when we reject killing as a legitimate animal, uh, as a legitimate uh, tool for managing populations, Maybe it will stop killing ourselves. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can reduce the violence in American society. Hey, guys, we can have world peace. But where does it start? It starts here. It starts now. We want a no-kill nation. I am going to be with you 
every step of the way as we achieve this result. Let's get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.